Salvete Sodales. Welcome, Latin comrades. I'm so glad that you've decided to join me in the study of Latin. I can already tell that you are a smart, sophisticated, and savvy individual. Great things are in store for both of us, and I can't wait to begin this course with you. We're going to start Latin with the very basics, the alphabet, pronunciation, and accents. We've got to take to heart what Thomas Aquinas once said, parvos error in principio, magnus est in fine. A small mistake in the beginning is a big one in the end. That's why I'm going to provide in this first session a general overview of Latin. Getting these things right in the beginning goes a long way in fine, in the end. Although I know you're eager to dive into the endless pool of Latin awaiting us, we have to first wade in before swimming. But don't worry, we'll get there. This first session is going to have a slightly different format than the others. Our main agenda right now is to figure out how to pronounce Latin in a consistent way. When you've sufficiently learned the basics that I discuss here, you're ready to pass go, collect 200 denarii, and proceed to the next order of business, which is the genius of the Latin language. Okay, let's start with the Roman alphabet. According to Isidore of Seville, 7th century Spanish bishop, there are three things associated with each letter of the alphabet. Nomen, figura, and potestas. Isidore explained that a letter's nomen, or name, refers to how it's called. A letter's figura, or shape, to how it's formed and a letter's potestas, or meaning, to how it's signified. Take the first letter of the Latin alphabet, for example. Its nomen is a, or a. Its figura is the particular shape, that squiggly line. And its potestas indicates its meaning. Now, because English uses the Roman alphabet, you're already familiar with the nomen, figura, and potestas of each letter in the alphabet. So there's nothing more to say here other than congratulations on achieving your first Latin milestone. Well done. Latin is identical to English when it comes to the alphabet. There's vowels and there's consonants. All the letters are written from left to right. And there's also combinations of letters that make distinct sounds. Pretty easy, right? Although the pronunciation of Latin is obviously different from English, there's lots of similarities between them. Here's the Latin alphabet in upper and lower case. Do you see anything missing? I sure do. I noticed that Latin doesn't have the letter W, and the letters K, Y, and Z don't appear very frequently. Also, Latin has two letters called glides that sometimes appear as vowels and sometimes as consonants. Pretty cool. The two glides are I and U. When the Latin letter I acts as a consonant, it can be represented as J or I. In a pretty similar way, when the Latin letter U acts as a consonant, it can be symbolized as V or you. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this can be confusing, at least it was for me, but we'll soon get used to it. And by the way, the variation in spelling doesn't affect the meaning of the word. It has the same meaning and the same pronunciation. Speaking of which, let's turn our attention to pronunciation. Now, believe it or not, there's no universal way to pronounce Latin. Instead, Pronunciation varies according to time period, geographic region, content focus, and personal preference. The most common systems of pronunciation are what I'm going to refer to as first classical, second ecclesiastical, and third national. Let's start with the first. Classical pronunciation takes as its model educated Roman authors who lived roughly from the first century BC 
to the second century AD. Because each of these people has been dead for, I don't know, two millennia, advocates of this pronunciation use ancient writings to reconstruct how Latin was arguably spoken by these educated classes of Romans. According to many scholars, this reconstructed model is the closest that we can get to the actual pronunciation of Roman Latin. So, if you want to speak Latin like Cicero, then classical Latin is your best bet. Next, we have ecclesiastical Latin. Ecclesiastical pronunciation doesn't try to imitate how Latin was spoken 2,000 years ago. For the most part, it's the type of pronunciation used by the Roman Catholic Church located in the Vatican. To many, ecclesiastical pronunciation sounds like Latin with an Italian accent. So, if you want to speak like Thomas Aquinas, then I recommend the ecclesiastical pronunciation. All right, finally, we have a third category. National pronunciation generally follows the pronunciation of a person's mother tongue. So, this could be English, Italian, French, Esperanto, you name it. When it comes down to it, a national pronunciation is the easiest way to pronounce Latin because you simply pronounce letters like you would in your native language and you don't concern yourself with other, more standardized ways of speaking Latin. So, if you want to speak like the guy living across the street from you, then a national pronunciation is the way to go. Okay, let's look at a simple example, John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. First, the classical pronunciation. In principio eret verbum, et verbum eret apudeum, et Deus eret verbum. Did you notice that my V's sounded like W's, and the C was a hard C, like an English K? That's classical Latin. This is going to be different from the ecclesiastical pronunciation. For instance, in principio eret verbum, et verbum eret apodeum, et deus eret verbum. Did you notice that the V's sounded like V's in English? And the C was like a CH or CH sound. In other words, it sounds like Italian, doesn't it? Last, let's pronounce the sentence according to a national pronunciation. Now, this one is going to hurt. I'm going to do an American national pronunciation. In principio eret verbum, et verbum eret apudeum, et deus eret verbum. Ooh, that was scary. It sounded a bit like Latin in cowboy boots, but you get the picture. National pronunciation sounds like English, if you're an English speaker. So, which system of pronunciation should you adopt? Well, traditionally, I'd say that the classical form has been standard for those studying Roman Latin, while the ecclesiastical form has been customary for those studying ecclesiastical Latin. National Latin, by contrast, isn't really centralized, almost by definition. Obviously, it's going to vary from region to region, so if you're a native French speaker, for instance, it's just going to sound like French. Personally, and this is just my opinion, I believe that any pronunciation is acceptable as long as there's consistency. That stated, I'm partial to ecclesiastical or classical pronunciation since these are fairly standardized, and I've used both in different places and at different times. For example, although I was originally taught ecclesiastical pronunciation, years later I switched to the classical pronunciation, which is my personal preference. So, when I say words in Latin, I will always use the classical pronunciation so you will get very familiar with it. Let's turn to vowels. Latin has the same number of vowels as English, which is fantastic, right? But Latin also distinguishes between short and long vowels. Traditionally, long vowels take about twice as long to enunciate as short ones. So it's the difference between a short a, ah, which is ah, and a long a, ah, which is ah. But 
this is not a practice that many people follow today. Most people don't really bother with distinguishing between short and long vowels when speaking. Now, here's the tricky part. How do you know if a vowel is long or short? For the most part, you only know this because the vowel is depicted as either having a line over the vowel, called a macron, or it doesn't. Now, if it has a line over a vowel, it's long. If it doesn't have one, it's short. For our purposes, though, we don't need to concern ourselves with this information. For the time being, just know that a line over a vowel indicates that it's long, which can help us better distinguish different forms of words in certain circumstances. When two vowels come together to form only one sound, it's called a very strange name, a diphthong. Seriously, who makes up these names? Perhaps someone who watches a lot of science fiction or something, I don't know. At any rate, keep in mind that two vowels appearing next to each other often join forces and make one sound instead of two. Now, there are about half dozen such combinations in Latin that appear very frequently. A, au, e, eu, i, ui. Now, depending on which pronunciation model you adopt, the pronunciation will be slightly different, so don't worry. Now, let's turn to consonants. The majority of consonants in Latin are pronounced as they are in English. The exceptions to this rule appear in the chart here. Because English pronunciation varies from region to region and country to country, my American accent may or may not be helpful to you. But for the sake of an example, I'll briefly pronounce the letters all the way to the left of the chart, which is the classical pronunciation. I mentioned that all pronunciations are acceptable, and they are. Even the ones that sound like Matthew McConaughey speaking Latin. But in order to limit confusion, I'll only use the classical pronunciation here. Beginning with the top left, the letters and letter combinations are k, k, g, h, w, ng, p, r, sk, and t. I'll just highlight two consonants, the C and the V. Now, in classical pronunciation, the C is always hard. In other words, it's always like the C in cupcake, which isn't a Latin word, unfortunately. As for the V, it's always pronounced as a W in English. That is to say, like the W in water wheel. Now, before we end this session, I want to briefly introduce just one more item, accents. The concept of accent is often categorized according to pitch or stress. While a pitch accent is increased by articulating a syllable at a higher note, a stress accent is increased by using greater force. Now, I readily admit that these two kinds of accents are easy to confuse, so we're going to keep things very basic. Every word in Latin has one place of stress. That is, there's one syllable that you pronounce with a little bit more force than every other syllable. For instance, look at this word, which means girl. How do you pronounce it? Well, there's three syllables. So the stress has to be on one of them. But which one? Is it puela? Is it puela? Or is it puela? Well, it's actually the last example, puela. Now, how do I know that? There are four simple rules to learn when it comes to where to put the Latin accent or stress in a word. Here are the four most basic guidelines. In a word with only one syllable, that is that it's monosyllabic, or two syllables, which is disyllabic, the stress is always on the first syllable. For example, 
hik, hik, pater, and mater. I will not include accent marks in words with two or fewer syllables since the stress will always be predictably known. Second, in a word with three or more syllables, that is that it is polysyllabic, the stress is on the second to last or penultimate syllable if that vowel is long. For example, cogitare. Or on the third to last, that is the anti-penultimate syllable, if the second to last vowel is short. For example, iterum. This is because Latin generally prefers the accent to be as far back as possible in a word. Third, in any word, the accent will never be further back than the anti-penultimate. Romans had standards after all. Fourth, in a word that receives the addition of an appendage such as ne or we or que, the stress falls on the last syllable of the word. For example, filio turns into filioque. However, because I'm such a nice man, I'm going to place an accent mark on words with three or more syllables to show where the stress is located, and I'll also include a macron to designate the length of vowels. This is going to make things much easier. Okay, in conclusion, we've learned three things in this session. First, the Latin alphabet. Second, Latin pronunciation. And third, Latin stress. What I recommend for you to do now is begin reading a Latin Bible. Or if you want to get wild and crazy, find a Latin passage from Thomas Aquinas or Augustine of Hippo and begin practicing your pronunciation. You can easily do this online. Now, you should aim for consistency, but don't be concerned at all if your pronunciation isn't yet polished, precise, or even pretty to listen to. It's going to take time, but we'll get there. Until next time, Walete Sudales. Farewell, Latin comrades.